I have to be honest, I don't know if this is true for everybody, but everything that happened before I came to Japan feels like it's not even real. <laughs> because <laughs> Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back to the Korekara Podcast. So before we get into anything, like the video, smash it, smash it hard, obliterate it. But today we will be having on Nick or Nicholas Edwards on the podcast. You guys might've heard of him on Twitter. Uh, Dogen and Matt were tweeting about him. Both Dogen and Matt have said that they think that Nick has better Japanese than them. Recently, he was just on Matt versus Japan's channel, but we're really glad to talk to him today. But if you guys are enjoying the podcast, make sure to share the podcast with somebody who's studying Japanese. For real, it helps us out a lot, keeps us continuing doing what we like to do here and helping you guys out, have your favorite guests on. So keep on subscribing. I hope you guys enjoy this podcast with Nick. It was a fun one, fun conversation. So we'll see you at the end. All right, Nick, can you give us a quick background of who you are and where you're at today? Yes. Uh, my name is Nicholas Edwards. I go by Nick on YouTube. Um, I was born and raised in, well, technically outside of the Portland, Oregon area. So I'm from West Coast, Pacific Northwest. Um, I started studying Japanese. Uh, when I was 14, when I entered high school, and uh, I moved to Japan when I was 17. So now that I'm saying that out loud, three short years later, <laughs> I moved to Japan <laughs> when I was 17 um, to become a singer, uh, actually. So I've been in Japan now for, I'm 28 at the moment, so I've been in Japan for actually exactly 11 years this month. Wow. So um, I've... I, basically it, it doesn't even really feel like I'm in a foreign country anymore. I'm just, just chilling at home. <laughs> so I, I work as a singer, uh, sometimes actor model or whatever, you know, if there's a check, then <laughs> I'm just if kidding. A check, you'll be there. <laughs> I, I have a talent to match that check. If you... <laughs> um, no, yeah, yeah. So I, I do, I do entertainment in Japan. That's that's where I'm at right now. Yeah. I guess like uh, starting from like the very beginning of your relationship with Japan. How did you get into Japan Japanese in the first place? I always feel bad when people ask me this question because I feel like I should have like a really like I loved. I don't know, like I loved um, right. anime or I loved this or that, but I didn't really know anything about Japan or Japanese until I decided to take it as my second language in high school. And the reason that I took it as my second language was really not because I was specifically interested in Japanese, but um, in Oregon, it's pretty common where I grew up in Oregon, it's pretty common to have uh, Japanese as an option for second language in high school. I think a lot of high schools do Spanish, French, German, Japanese are usually like the four choices. And for me, obviously, I, I think this is true in most of the states, but um, you have to you have to take a second language to graduate high school um, for a couple years. So when I was basically faced with that decision, I just thought that, you know, Spanish, French, German, all European languages that are written for the most part, similarly to English, I just thought it might be interesting to try Japanese. And I was not a very good student <laughs> in middle school. So uh, I just hated doing homework. Um, so I I asked my homeroom teacher, I was like, I think I want to do Japanese. And my homeroom teacher was like, you don't, you can't even, you don't even do your English homework. How are you going <laughs> to choose the hardest <laughs> language? And I was, I didn't like that answer very much. So I was like, well how dare you insult my intelligence and then i just chose japanese to kind of like spite her i guess <laughs> and then i really definitely spited her because now i speak japanese so <laughs> that was kind of like the beginning um and then i just have been studying so so i was 14 when i started studying yeah but so did you like kind of fall in love with the language when you started studying because i i saw one of your videos where you talked about how you learned Japanese, and you said you studied four years of Japanese in two years, yeah. basically. So you must have been, like, really passionate. Um, it's funny. I I was definitely... I liked studying language, because I liked language arts, even, like, in, my native language, English, like, since I was young. That was always my favorite class, was definitely not math, definitely not science. <laughs> <laughs> so I liked... I liked language arts because it was creative and I mean obviously since I work in the entertainment industry I think I I enjoy creative fields um so I liked 
languages to begin with. So even when I started, immediately when I started studying Japanese, I was always pretty, um, I don't want to say ahead of the class, but I was always pretty like, I was definitely like actually trying. You know, I think a lot of people who study second languages in high school just study them to get their credits and kind of move on. Um, I was really interested in the idea of studying a language from the beginning, but after probably studying for maybe like a semester or so, I was really, uh, I started listening to Japanese music and because I already liked music since I was little or since I was young, um, those two kind of like interests kind of melded together and became, uh, one big interest in kind of like being able to sing in Japanese. And that really became my motivation for studying the language. And I guess like that hardcore phase of like, uh, oh, study yeah. four years, <laughs> two years. What, what did that look like? That study? Um, so I was pretty much on schedule for the first semester, I think. But by the end of the first semester, I was like, this is not progressing fast enough for me. And I, I like really want to learn Japanese like now. And so I just talked to my teacher and I was like, oh, can I kind of like move ahead? And because of like the nature of a high school language course, I mean, she already had all of everything prepared, like in packets or whatever that she, cause there's Japanese one, two, three, and four for freshman, sophomore, junior, senior classes. And so I think I ended up in my second semester of freshman year or for our, your international viewers, my first year of high school, <laughs> um, <laughs> I started moving forward in my second semester and I f ended up finishing the full second year. So what would have been my second year of studying in high school in the first year. And then in that second year, actually technically in the, the first semester of my second year, I finished junior and senior Japanese. And then oh, I started wow. kind of just using my, um, using like other learning materials that I had bought online or like at a store or whatever. Um, and, t and talking to my Japanese mm -hmm. teacher and getting her help. Um, so I, I really was not like, I mean, I don't really know. I wasn't trying to study really hard. If that makes sense. I just really enjoyed with <laughs> like studying. So, I ended up moving forward more than I, more so than I was like, Oh, I want to get through this. I'm like, I'm on the course to fluency. Right. I wasn't even really thinking about it as studying a language so much as I was just really like earnestly enjoying what I was doing. So, um, I, I say that I like finished, you know, the, the four years and two years. And that sounds like I'm like sitting there with my nose in a book, like just <laughs> going for it. But I really, it was, Partially, of course, I did have my nose in books or like flashcards or whatever, but I was watching a lot of Japanese TV and listening to a lot of Japanese music. And those were kind of like the, the main ways that I was studying the language. With movies and TV, did you use subtitles or did you just like make yourself watch it all? Like I'm raw? trying to think, I have to be honest. I, I don't know if this is true for everybody, but everything that happened before I came to Japan feels like it's not even real <laughs> because it's like, it's, I've been in, it, it's such a stark difference between, and, and it be, because I was 17 when I came, it was like my childhood and then my adulthood are like so completely separate from each other. So right. I don't even really remember, but I'm pretty sure that in the beginning I was definitely watching with subtitles because I was trying to just, um, like, you know, read the subtitles and then uh, like keep an ear out for, um, words that I thought I should know or like, oh, this is how they're saying it, you know, in, in this setting or whatnot. And, um, so I watched with subtitles and then eventually as my Japanese got better and better, I, I, I don't think that I ever sat there and like watched something that I was not at least getting the gist of without subtitles to just like listen to a bunch of Japanese I didn't understand, but I progressed at Japanese enough that I didn't need subtitles after probably like after a year, after I finished the four years of sophomore year, um, I then I probably was not watching with subtitles anymore. Yeah. And, and then after that you did like a, like a homestay experience, right? Was that like after you graduated? Uh, no, school? that was actually the summer between my sophomore and junior year. So I was, uh, 
15 when I first visited Japan. I spent half the time here in Tokyo and half the time in um, uh, Shizuoka in a city called Fukuroi, which is the sister city of um, the city where my high school was at, Hillsboro in Oregon. Um, so that was kind of the, and that was probably like a little less than three months. I see. So how, how did you kind of get into that homestay? Cause most of the time you, you don't hear about as many homestays in high school versus like college when it becomes a lot easier to like go out. And so it wasn't maybe through your, your Japanese teacher where you found out about it. Um, actually, so my, the city that, it, that I went to school in is Hillsboro in Oregon. And, right. um, be through their sister city program. I had, a uh, exchange student. Well, I guess not an exchange student because they didn't go to school, but, uh, a, a, <laughs> a student from Fukuroi in Japan stayed at my house in my, during my freshman year for a few weeks. Oh. And so I ended up going to visit them over the summer, the following year. Um, so it was just that kind of relationship that was built with, through that kind of sister city relationship. Um, I see. And, uh, and because I'd been in Japanese class, I had a lot of, uh, friends who like knew Japanese people or whatnot. And I, um, had a, one of my upper classmen, well, <laughs> We don't say that. One of my, <laughs> the students older than me. I wanted to say senpai, but I, didn't know I, I can that see was... the look in your eye, Nick. I can see. The look in your eye. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to say senpai, but that's such a an internet joke at this point that I was like, my senpai. <laughs> like, um, my so one of my the students who were older than me in uh, my Japanese class um, had done like the same kind of exchange with um somebody in tokyo as well and so i was introduced to them when they had visited uh oregon so oh, okay. i uh got the opportunity to stay half in tokyo and half in um my the the sister city in shizuoka yeah do you do you remember like how your japanese was when you did that home state experience um not really, <laughs> but I do, I did not have any, well, I mean, I, didn't, I don't want to say I didn't have any trouble, but I did, I was not struggling to communicate by the time that I visited Japan for the first time. So I was 15. I'd been studying for two years at that point. Um, and I, even coming to Japan, if I didn't understand something, I could have it explained to me in Japanese and figure out what it meant just in Japanese. So I didn't need to be like Googling things. I didn't even have a cell phone, so I wouldn't have been Googling right. things anyways. <laughs> but, um, uh, but so I was not as good at Japanese as I would think that I probably am now, but I was definitely speaking at a level that was, um, sufficient, I guess. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Cause like I saw the, the video where, I think you were talking about how you would make a lot of pitch accent mistakes and then your host, your home state yeah. family would correct you. But even the video you, you put of like you saying like Hatashina, you, you were still like pretty fluent in yeah. that, in that clip, I was I like, I think 16 or 17 in that clip. Um, and I don't know, that was, <laughs> I cannot watch that speech back because, you know, the thing about pitch accent that is so like, I guess, um, because I've made so many pitch accent mistakes, you know, you get that secondhand cringe when you hear yourself making, well, that's not secondhand because it's yourself, but you get, I like cringe every time I hear it because I'm like, oh, so he didn't know anything about anything. <laughs> but the funny thing is I actually won that speech contest though. Um, when I was 16. Oh. So I was, I, I know that it wasn't like, uh, so terrible that people were not like understanding me, but it's just, you know, one of those things where it's the same with like my music. Like if I listen to music that I released like seven, eight years ago, I'm like, that was who even is he? <laughs> so 
<laughs> it was a uh, the the pitch accent was something that my uh, host mother was very um, very conscious of for me, which I'm I'm very grateful for. Even though sometimes I was like, okay. I know that you know what I'm saying, though, so can you just <laughs> let me talk? But, uh, you know, I think Japanese people... I'm doing a stage play right now, um, and pitch accent comes up all the time because pitch accent is, like, even different just within Tokyo. Like, everybody kind of has their own idea of way words the words are pronounced. And there is, like, a standardized version of Japanese, Hyojungo, but... Um, mm -hmm. no, almost nobody besides people who like specifically go out of their way to figure out exactly what the like correct pitch accent is on every word can actually speak it Hyojungo perfectly. Even people who were born and raised in Tokyo. Um, so mm -hmm. it's definitely something that is important to Japanese people because I'm, it's not, nobody's that strict with me. But even during the stage play, you know, Japanese people will be like, that's not what was the other day, um, just yesterday, there was, uh, we were talking about yoshi. It means like the way you look. And then, um, yoshi means, uh, like a paper, a paperwork, basically. Even Japanese people in the play will make mistakes with words like that that you don't use frequently. So the actor is trying to say yoshi. But because that's not a word that you, like, say every day, and even if you do, people pronounce it differently depending on where you are. So the correct, like, standardized Japanese would be yoshi. But a lot of people just say yoshi as, like, a flat reading, and they don't realize that that's technically not correct. So pitch accent is never going to be, like, perfect. But um, I think I've, I, I was fortunate to have that my host mother who corrected me when I made mistakes and um I am doing decent now. <laughs> <laughs> have you have you ever gone like mistaken for just like being born and raised in Japan? Because your pitch accent is probably like nearly perfect. Right? Yeah. Um I think that I mean I don't I don't want to like brag, but <laughs> I think that if I like call someone on the phone, for example, something I get a lot is um when I call, like, Kuyaksho, I don't know how to say that in English, like, the, the ward office, which would be, like, I guess, like, the city, the city government building, or, like, office, if you, like, want to get, I don't know, like, something about insurance or something about this or that, um, right. then I'll call them on the phone and be like, I'm, look, I want to figure out how, what I need, to, I can't, God, I can't speak English. <laughs> 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 I'm trying to figure out, like, for example, how much I have to, how much do I owe in insurance? I can't remember w how far I paid or I paid in advance or whatever. And they'll be like, well, we can't tell you. We have to have, like, verbal confirmation from the actual, actual Nicholas Edwards. And like, no, you're speaking <laughs> to the actual Nicholas Edwards. And they're like, oh, we didn't, we didn't think, we thought you were a Japanese person calling because he didn't speak Japanese. So, <laughs> so I get, I think wow. I've, make few enough mistakes that Japanese people either don't even notice that I have an accent or they think that it's a regional accent and not like a foreign accent. What about like in person, like you're speaking face to face someone, but they're, they're still like convinced you're like full. Well, I get Japanese. people who ask me if I'm like half Japanese a lot, which blows my mind because I don't think that I look Japanese at all, <laughs> but but I think that it's one of those things where, I mean, it's a vibe, you know, like uh -huh. you, there's just that, like right. the, the kind of way that Japanese people make facial expressions. And one that I specifically get on my YouTube channel a lot in the comments is my, the, like the way that I laugh. People are like, that's, you laugh like a Japanese person, which <laughs> I mean, I have no idea what the difference is, <laughs> but I think that it's just, it's just a, an observation, I guess. But I think that maybe because I've been in Japan for so long, I just, the kind of like secondary traits that not necessarily my face, but like my expressions and maybe right. like my mannerisms seem Japanese to people. And they seem Japanese to Japanese people as well. So 
um, I do get like, people don't even ask me where I'm from because they just assume that I grew up here. Um, but they ask me like, or they'll ask me like, where are your parents from? I'm like, my parents and myself are from <laughs> Portland, Oregon. Um, and they're like, oh, I thought you grew up here. So I guess I make few enough pitch accent mistakes that people um, don't think that Japanese is obviously, like very obviously my second language. So that mm -hmm. I have been very blessed with um, people who were kind enough to correct, spend time that I'm sure it was obnoxious for me and I'm sure it was just as obnoxious for them <laughs> to have to correct it all the time. Uh, and then, you know, the, the work that I do it involves hearing myself talk a lot, like I do radio shows and of course, you know, TV and now YouTube. So I, I have a lot of opportunities to kind of hear myself speaking Japanese um, played back to me. And so that also is something that, because with pitch accents specifically, that's something that sometimes when you're speaking Japanese, you just, because you're thinking about what you're trying to say while you're speaking, just whatever language you're speaking, you sometimes don't notice when you have like weird pauses or like, like mistakes, I guess, in pronunciation or like kind of like the flow of your sentence. So when I listen back, I'm like, oh, that, how did I pronounce that so incorrectly and <laughs> not even notice? Um, so I think that that also helps just having a lot of opportunities to kind of listen to myself speaking and be like, that is incorrect and this isn't correct or whatever it might be. Yeah. I think, I think it's like a big thing to like, listen back to your speech, Like even for us, like recording this podcast and we're speaking English, uh, when we're first starting out and like editing, we, we notice a lot of like really bad habits that we have speaking or like grammar mistakes, but yeah, yeah, it's like supposedly native language. I have the same thing especially since i don't speak english very often right. i was watching a conversation i mean this is probably true with the conversation that i had with matt a, a few weeks ago or a week ago or i don't even remember how long ago it was <laughs> but um i say like so many times and i don't know if that's just because of I, I want to say like so bad but i just said that i say it too many times um right. i don't know if that's because of like my generation <laughs> I can't not say it I can't even speak English without saying it but somebody like emailed my um my YouTube channel and was like god damn I can't stop saying it now I'm thinking about it every time I say it we'll, we'll just cut it out it's gonna be a like cut it out <laughs> very a counter so. just take like a shot cuts. every time he says like <laughs> meet god um <laughs> So they emailed my, my YouTube channel and said, um, you said like, like 147 times. <laughs> like, how oh. did you, you like, really sat through that whole thing and were like, it's waiting for me to say like the whole time. <laughs> and kind of, apparently I say kind of a lot. And I also say definitely a lot, which <laughs> I feel like is probably like a West right. Coast thing. <laughs> definitely. <Right>. Definitely. <laughs> Yeah, we'll see if we get a counter going in the comments this video. <laughs> How many times yeah. I say like? Maybe we can have a oh, live oh, counter oh, on the video. Just as we go. Oh, you don't wanna you don't wanna have to work that hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean it's funny because like if you go to our very first podcast, I think I like me myself for sure, I was going off like with the likes on like rapid fire. I was it was, yeah. it was something else for sure, so yeah, I mean, take a shot every time you say like is actually one of the comments. Oh, yeah. on, on the <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know right what it is. I feel like there it is. I feel I feel like <laughs> it's it's almost it's almost um because like uh -huh. doesn't even me like mean anything. <laughs> right. Or maybe it's a West Coast thing. I don't know, but. Um, I apparently say it all the time, so. <laughs> Do you have any sorts of, like, uh, kuchikuse for Japanese? Like, I, I know a lot of people say, like, mitai no. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, God, people tell me all the time that I say, uh, that it, you say this all the time, and it, it never sticks in my head. There isn't a word in Japanese that is as prevalent as like. Like, you can't just, 
other than like uh-huh. like yeah. um yeah. like ano or etto but um i definitely say one thing that i say a lot is yosuru ni yosuru ni kono so i like it means basically i guess so basically what you're trying what i'm trying to say is like i'm summarizing what i just yeah. said but in like a more compact form at the end and i guess i do that a lot probably because of the field that i work in and i have to be careful what i say and make sure that people understand exactly what i'm saying so that i'm not you know canceled yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good reason most of the time <laughs> i'm so afraid to speak english on the internet because i'm like i don't i don't think that i'm a problematic person generally but you never know <laughs> i'm sure that i have you know um i i am sure that i i would accidentally do something that could be offensive so i i don't want to like offend right. anybody um but and that's a lot easier to do in japanese because japanese is so much more gen- like general and you could kind of just skirt around whatever you're trying to say without having to like actually say it but english you kind mm-hmm. of say everything the entire time so <laughs> I feel like it's just the perfect right. language to offend the people in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hopefully we won't see next week Nick gets canceled for saying like 201 <laughs> times in one video. <laughs> They're canceling me for like. Are you enjoying the podcast so far? Because this is just our first part of a conversation with Nick where we talk about how he learned Japanese. In the second part, we're going to be talking about his struggles and difficulties living in Japan and working as a professional celebrity artist. So make sure to subscribe and hit the bell so you don't miss that. And th- thanks for making it to the end of part one. Part two should be coming out in a couple of days. But go ahead and leave us a comment and let us know what you thought of this podcast. In the meantime, you can also check out some of our podcasts that we did way back, like the one we did with Matt. But I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.